only because we started so early that we had the luxury of making some of those mistakes and not getting killed. You know, we need things that can scale and do it enormously quickly to, to actually make a dent uh, on the whole problem. It's part of why uh, the bottleneck in getting enough materials to make those batteries. And why and did you step down from your possession in 2019 and then you recently came back on the board? Well, you know, how concerned are you that this country or even your own company will overinvest heavily in a supply chain based on current lithium ion technology only to have newer, cheaper battery chem chemistries enter the market? Where in the battery supply chain do you expect there to be bottlenecks over the next five years? Hmm, it's a good question. I こんにちは。テスラ全力チャンネルのタイツです。今回はめったに表に出てこないテスラの技術開発を創業から15年間 CTO として支えてきて、今年取締役に復帰した JB ストロベル氏によるテスラの将来のバッテリー開発、技術展望を詳しくご紹介しようと思います。テスラの売り上げの大部分を占める主力ビジネスの EV やメガパックは、リン酸鉄リチウムイオンバッテリー、いわゆる LFP によるものなんですが、テスラのことをよく知らない人からは数あるバッテリーの中でなぜこの LFP を採用したのかこの LFP に大きく依存しても良いのかバッテリー技術が大きく進化した時にテスラの技術的優位性が揺らぐのではないかといった心配の声をいただくことがあります実際トヨタは2028年から販売を計画している EV に搭載予定の全固体電池には現在はコストがボトルネックにはなっているものの充電率 10% から 80% への急速充電時間において10分以下を目指していますそのため LFP よりも科学的特性ですとか物理的な安定性において優れているので将来的にテスラの事業価値を脅かすのではないかとご指摘いただいているのです今回こうした市場の懸念に対して JB ストローベルの将来展望は参考になる部分もありますのでその意見を詳しく聞いてみたいと思います。Right. So, yeah. And、um, we, we need that across. And you know, Tesla has certainly done that in the auto industry, though the brand has been damaged recently. You know, Tesla you know, did amazing things、um, and was rewarded rich, richly for it, yet the brand has also been damaged by the politics, the offensive comments of, of Elon Musk recently. Why did you step down from your possession in 2019 and then you recently came back on the board? Well, I, I mean, I love Tesla. I always have. You know, I, I feel like、uh, you know, it has some sort of place in my heart and it probably will for the rest of my life.、Um, you know, I love the team there. I love the mission, the products. You know, it just, it, it's, it's awesome.、Um, it doesn't mean it's an easy place to work. You know, it's, it's challenging. It, it kind of needs to be to be successful, I think.、Mm. You know, part of why you know, I decided to, to leave back in 2019, and, and it was an incredibly difficult personal decision, probably the most difficult decision business wise in my life,、um, was really reflecting on what I enjoy and what I'm good at. You know, I, I love being an entrepreneur, and I love creating and building and being an engineer, you know, actually being hands on and, and really tinkering and building things.、Mm -hmm. You know, certainly that was still possible to some degree at Tesla, but you know, more and more the company needed you know, execution at scale. It needed you know, vehicle deliveries, it needed sales, it needed manufacturing ramp.、Um, and you know, I, there, were, there were people that are you know, more passionate about that and frankly much better at it than me.、Mm -hmm. And you know, that's, that's kind of a, a difficult thing to admit sometimes when you're in the midst of it, and especially if you've kind of like grown in an organization to, to have a position where maybe you're managing these people or alongside them, yet kind of have to realize that, you know, wow, these people are, are they're really passionate about doing the thing that I have to kind of force myself to do because I know it's important. So for me, that was, that was all part of that calculus.、Um, レッドウッドマテリアルズは JB がテスラを退任後、新しく立ち上げたバッテリーを再利用する会社です。この会社は JB の思惑通り、EV を含めたバッテリー再利用市場の拡大を背景に大きく成長して、現在は上場一歩手前まで来ています。実際に上場するのか、テスラなどの大手企業に買収を目的とした出口戦略を持っているのかは JB 次第なんですが、少なくともこうしたコメントを聞いている限り JB 自身は安定志向ではないことからレッドウッドマテリアルズやテスラのバッテリー領域における新たなチャレンジを今後も牽引していくことになると思いますこうした JB のチャレンジ精神はこの後も解説する今後のテスラの技術基盤を決定する上での大きな戦略の指針となります And I also, you know, from a topic point of view 
really, I love learning. And I wanted to, to kind of go into a, an adjacent, supportive, I thought, field, um, you know, where I could do something that would potentially kind of float all the ships and help electrification, help sustainability, uh, you know, more broadly, uh, using kind of what I'd seen and what I learned in our, our struggles and some of our, our challenges at Tesla. Products, and I, I don't see how we make the world sustainable without storage. And right now, batteries, lithium ion batteries, largely are the scalable economic you know, solution to that. Doesn't mean they'll be the only one forever. As you said, there's, there's new technologies coming, but, but right now, you know, this is kind of the core technology in grid storage at the utility scale, grid storage at the home scale, electric vehicles. You know, it, it's quite pervasive when you really look across all these different products. Um, it's part of why uh, the bottleneck in getting enough materials to make those batteries and having access to, to the batteries at all uh, is, is such a scary bottleneck to me. You know, when I looked at this whole transition, I said, geez, you know, that, that could derail, you know, simultaneously a whole bunch of different industries and slow this whole transition down. So it's yeah, we saw that in solar. There was solar prices have been going down, down, down for decades, and then solar ticked up because of those supply constraints. It's kind of a good problem to have, but ここで初めてテスラによる LFP 以外の選択肢を匂わせる言葉が出てきました。テスラがこれまでリチウム鉱山への出資ですとか、生成企業への買収を持ちかけるなど、LFP、リチウムイオンをベースとしたバッテリーエコシステムに対して大きな出資をしてきたという懸念ですとか、新たな技術シフトへのリスクに対して回答をここからしていくことになります。そしてその影響は EV 業界のみならず他の業界のパラダイムシフトを含む大きな変化につながると言っているのです。Yeah, but uh, you know, how concerned are you that this country or even your own company will overinvest heavily in a supply chain based on current lithium-ion technology, only to have newer, cheaper battery chem chemistries enter the market? Uh, I mean that that one. I'm really not worried about that one. Um, you know that uh, it, it, it's it's a question and a concern that comes up frequently. I've, I've you know it's come up throughout the entire arc of of, uh, of the development at Tesla, and you know I think you know the the timeline is so long on on some products. You know like a new EV. You know to to conceive of it, to build a model year, to to ramp it, lifetime of that product. Um, You know, the tech, even if a battery technology sort of matured and changed, if solid state, um, you know, promises everything it can do, it'll be wonderful, but it's relevant a product generation or two in the future. So I don't see really any risk right now that we're under, we're over investing, mm -hmm. I should say, in, in scale on, on some of these products. For, from every angle I look at it, we're, we're dramatically under investing. And you know, under investing in the supply chain, under investing in refining infrastructure products. So that that's that's what keeps me up at night. It's not not an over investment concern. I mean, unfortunately, you know, it's going to take so long for us to to you know reduce the entire because really the amount of oil consumption scales with the fleet of cars, not with the new cars sold. You know, a lot of times we track our progress on EVs against new cars sold. You know, and we we're celebrating 20%, you know, which is huge. It's a great milestone. Right. But that's 20% of the new cars going into a right. pool that takes perhaps 15 years to turn over. But anyway, I mean, I can't imagine what's more free though than driving an EV powered on solar energy at your own house. I mean, to me, that's that that's the most free, you know, set of products and technology you can possibly have. Um, You know, a, a, a cord is linking to your own roof. It's not linking to you know the Middle East or to you know uh, to even a different part of the U.S. Right, a petro state or something. And yeah, once you put the infrastructure, the sun literally is free once you invest in those costs. This transition will move a lot of wealth from one company, you know, one company to another. It moves jobs from one region to another. Mm. It has political impacts. It has government impacts. So any time that there's a, a you know something that some technical shift that affects people in such you know personal visceral ways that you know it's a very complex thing to to affect um, yeah so I, i guess i am i am a little bit you know concerned about you know how fast all those human complexities can can sort of work themselves through まず全固体電池に対してはワンダフル素晴らしいという意見がありましたさらにこうした技術は今採用している LFP が成熟したその先にあるという現在の技術開発が次世代につながるという認識を示しています
。こうした発言からテスラは全固体電池を含めたあらゆる選択肢を現在も検討した中、今の LFP 中心のバッテリー技術を選択していること。次世代の全固体電池を含めてテスラも技術開発を検討、進めていることがわかるわけです。そのため現在のバッテリーの生産ラインについては LFP に特化したものではなくて将来の新たなバッテリー技術やその技術が選択した時に応用できるようその余地を残しながら体制構築をしている可能性があります。また JB はこの技術を応用した未来に対するビジョンも明確に持っています。米国のエネルギー政策が日本と大きく異なるのは中東における地政学リスクを考慮した結果として電動化を進めてきたという点にありますがそもそもエネルギー効率という観点では国をまたいで石油資源を輸入するよりも今後50億年以上も持続的にエネルギーを発電し続けている太陽という巨大な核融合炉から電力を使用する各家庭や企業が直接エネルギーを取り出すことができればこれほど効率的なことはありませんこうしたビジョンはイーロン・マスクが人工核融合炉を作らないと宣言した背景に通じるものがあります Um, things like lithium, I think the resource base for lithium is pretty vast. I think the world has a lot of lithium, but we have not invested and we don't have a lot of lithium processing and refining capacity. So, as we sit here today, lithium refining, making it from you know, maybe a dilute salt water that you might find you know, in an aquifer or in a, a lake bed somewhere、uh, into you know, very high purity lithium needed for a battery,、uh, that's a big bottleneck. You know, I think we'll also see bottlenecks at a lot of the material manufacturing stages.、Um, you know, the, the supply chain to make a battery is surprisingly complex. You know, the supply chain for many things we do is surprisingly complex, but batteries especially so. And I think we'll see bottlenecks where we take those critical metals and then make them into the kind of specialty materials that function as a battery. So, in a Sort of computer analogy, it's almost like the semiconductor fabs that make things like cathode material.、Um, you know, and this stuff is really not very sexy, which makes it kind of hard to, to sometimes, I think, identify with. You know, these are uh, somewhat uh, non, non dramatic parts that, that you wouldn't notice if you saw them in your car, in your electric car, but, but they're very critical to the function of it. So I would say refining of things like nickel and lithium. And also the manufacturing of some of the, the core components、uh, that go into the, the functional battery. There's two big categories of competing lithium ion batteries. One is called, you know, has a few names, but sometimes it's called LFP, lithium iron phosphate, iron, lithium.、Um, the other is generally, you know, nickel, manganese, cobalt, NMC, you know, various flavors like that.、Um, the big, there's several differences, but if I kind of broadly described it, You know, lithium iron phosphate is a little bit lower cost. It doesn't use nickel、uh, and doesn't use very much cobalt or Veni,、um, and it's a little bit lower energy density. So, you know, it might be a slightly heavier battery to store a given amount of energy. So, in some applications, that may not matter as much. If you're putting a battery on, at a substation or in your basement at your house, maybe you don't care if it's 50% heavier or 30% heavier.、Mm -hmm. If it's in a vehicle and you're really concerned about, Crashworthiness or handling or range, you know, there the difference charge in mass, time. charge、yeah. time,、um, can, can matter. You know, I think one interesting thing、uh, that maybe we don't think about enough is that we need to look at the, the full life cycle of these different chemistries, you know, as they become remanufactured and recycled. Because a lot of times people compare this on sort of the first life and assume that there's no value left at the end of life. So, they kind of assume that they won't be recycled. But if you do plan that they will be recycled, the, the nickel chemistries, in my view, kind of take a little bit、uh, more of a,、uh, a leap forward because you can reuse those same elements many, many times. You know, therefore, the, the sort of mining impact of them and the upfront cost you know, can be moderated. But anyway, that, that's sort of a, a, a 10,000 foot view comparison between the two. I, I think they'll both coexist in the market. You know, very low end, maybe entry level vehicles that don't try and maximize range probably should be iron phosphate,、uh, LFP. You know, stationary batteries probably should be LFP. Whereas, you know, 
uh, longer range, you know, passenger EVs, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, sort of higher energy density batteries would probably tend toward nickel chemistries. So, so it, we could have a bunch of EVs, and then and then eventually we get when we get to scale, just keep recycling the materials for those batteries, and not have to do a lot of. Uh, importing, mining, new mining, et cetera. I mean, it, it's the ultimate energy security. If you have a fleet of EVs that are powered by sustainable energy, you know, in a region, you know, you, you don't need sort of this, this massive, you know, transport of chemicals that bring energy in or out of that. It's, it's supplied by, you know, solar or wind or, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, and those materials can be reprocessed. You know, we can do it today. It, it'll be even cheaper and easier to do when scale is a thousand X what it is today. 今回はこれまでテスラを CTO として支えてきた JB ストローベル氏によるインタビューの後半動画として主に EV 市場を大きく左右するバッテリーの将来展望についてご紹介してきました前回の動画のインタビュー前半部分ではテスラがここまで事業を順調に伸ばしてこれた理由と競合他社に対する認識も述べていますのでまだ見ていない方はそちらも合わせてご覧ください通常 EV など良いプロダクトを作ることだけでも難しいんですがそれがユーザーから受け入れられるようにマーケティングをすることは最も難しいものです。そしてさらに難しいのは自社のシェアが市場を占有した後に市場そのものを拡大する、つまりスケール化を図ることです。これはテスラ以外の競合がこれから直面する問題にもつながります。テスラ以外の競合が市場を占有しつつスケールメリットもあるテスラからシェアを奪うことはかなり難しくなると思うからです。その中で鍵を握るのは EV の中核的技術であるバッテリー戦略にあります。トヨタは全固体電池を搭載した EV を2028年から市場に投入する計画を発表していますが、今回のインタビューでも述べられたように、テスラのバッテリー技術を牽引してきた JB は、すでに全固体電池も視野に入れながら、現在の LFP バッテリーを採用していることがわかります。トヨタが持っている個別の技術レベルや企業としての統率力、グループ企業全体としての一体感という意味では、テスラ以上のものがあると思います。しかし、トヨタが全固体電池搭載型の EV を発表する頃には、テスラや BYD が収益化も図られている状態で市場シェアの過半数を独占し、全固体電池、もしくはそれを上回るバッテリーを開発している可能性があることを考慮すると、規模の経済が働く市場で一度取ってしまったシェアを奪い返すことは至難の技だと思います。トヨタは今回日本企業として初めて1兆円の営業利益を確保したと発表していますが、これは円安という一時的な要因ですとか、コロナ禍でサプライチェーンが寸断されていた半導体の供給体制が回復したという生産面の改善効果が見られたことに起因しているので、今後需要面では引き続き不安が残っています。いずれにせよ日本の主力企業のトヨタには日本人として頑張ってほしいところではあります一方のテスラは今回のインタビューでサンクコストなどの制約を受けずに余談なく常に様々な選択肢を同時並行的に検討しながら最適な技術選定を含めた事業設計を行っていることが分かりましたその中にはトヨタ同様に全固体電池の開発も水面下で検討場合によっては開発していることも示唆していて特定のバッテリー領域への過剰投資がテスラを窮地に追いやるという批判は杞憂に終わることが分かりますテスラはマスタープラン3に基づいて電動化による持続可能なエネルギー社会の実現を目指していてこうした社会における参入領域に応じて今回 JB が語ったように LFP の他にも NMC ですとか全固体電池など柔軟な技術を選定していくことが予想されるので競争優位性が損なわれることなく投資家として安心して保有し続けることができるわけです。今回の内容は以上です。最後までご覧いただきありがとうございました。動画の内容が良ければグッドボタンを押していただけると嬉しいです。それではまた次回の動画でお会いしましょう。バイバイ。